So welcome, Kelsey Hazard from Secular Pro-Life and Peggy Lunin with Life and Liberty for Women. We will be having a debate on abortion for this episode, and Kelsey is representing the pro-life side, and Peggy's representing the pro-choice side, and we'll start with uh, Kelsey's introduction of herself. Uh, hello. Uh, as, as you said, I'm Kelsey Hazard. I'm the founder and president of Secular Pro-Life. Uh, Secular Pro-Life is exactly what it sounds like. We make a non-religious case for protecting the right to life, uh, including pre-born life, although not limited to that. Um, and we are, our, our leadership is atheist and agnostic, uh, but we do, in fact, welcome all comers. So we get a lot of uh, religious minorities. Uh, pro-life Muslims, Wiccans, uh, things of that, and you know, people who aren't quite sure where they want to be as far as their religious life. Uh, we, we, you know, we get a pretty broad spectrum of people, more liberal Christians, really anyone who doesn't fit under the religious right umbrella and is pro-life winds up coming to secular pro-life. So that's, um, uh, you know, abortion is such a a broad debate, really, that I wind up going to a lot of different sources depending on what sub-issue of abortion we're talking about. Um, so, for instance, if we're talking about prenatal development, my go-to is uh, the Endowment for Human Development, uh, which is ehd.org. Uh, and that's a, that's an apolitical site. It's got uh, a lot of images and videos. It's really directed toward uh, parents and people who are trying to conceive. Um, so it's not a political site, but it just has some really cool uh, information and, and visualizes it really well. Um, for polling, so for uh, for polling, I was going to say uh, I like Gallup. Um, the 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 question that asks you, do you consider yourself pro life or pro choice, is less helpful because um, it varies really wildly. Whereas the questions about you know when do you think abortion should be legal uh, actually stay pretty steady. So you have a lot of uh, you know, variation in what you want to be called or what you want to identify as, but less variation in what Americans actually believe, uh, which, I, which I just think is really interesting. It's a lot about uh, your social perception, I guess. Um, uh, for health statistics, I usually go to government sources uh, like the CDC or National Center for Health Statistics. Uh, so, for instance, the CDC has some good data on pre uh, Roe v. Wade uh, abortion statistics, um, in 1972, uh, which is the year before Roe v. Wade, there were 39 deaths from illegal abortion and then another 24 from legal abortion because we often forget that even before Roe v. Wade, there were a handful of states where abortion was legal. So those, th that handful of states uh, contributed 24. Um, after Roe v. Wade the following year, obviously abor illegal abortion deaths went down because those people were just getting legal abortions instead. Uh, legal abortion deaths went up a little bit for a few years, uh, and then eventually they plateaued uh, so that we're now, now down to about 10 a year. Um, I, I will say, though, about the CDC that there's, there is a significant underreporting issue um, for legal abortion and the CDC because states voluntarily submit their data, and one of the states that declines to submit data is California, which is a huge abortion state, not just because of the population, but also as far as abortion businesses per capita, the rate of abortion, and the lack really of any uh, oversight for abortion in California. So that that is a problem with the CDC statistics, but the California problem is the California problem across time. It's consistent. So you can at least use the CDC data uh, for trends. Uh, so that's, that's where I get some, you know, just, and I, I could go on because, as I said, you know, abortion has so many sub parts to it that I find myself going all over the place for sources. Right. Do you want to talk about what inspired you to get involved in the movement? Sure. You know, I, <laughs> it's funny because, you know, so many people have some great conversion moment and it's a great story and I don't have that. <laughs> so I often find myself kind of skipping over that. Um, 
Yeah, I wasn't raised in an activist family. Nobody ever talked to me about abortion growing up or anything. Uh, it was a conclusion I came to on my own. And then, I, even then, I didn't really get involved until I was in college. So for me, it was a kind of a slower, more gradual process. But what it came down to really was that I couldn't swallow any of the justifications that were being offered for abortion. Because when I look at you know, um sort of the, the the traits that are being proposed that would distinguish a fetus from a newborn. Um, I, I found that whatever the trait is that's being proposed, it's never applied across the board, right? So it, it, it never is applied um, outside of the abortion context to born people. So, for instance, you know, people with desires um, – Aren't, it, you, you don't require someone to have desire uh, to live outside the womb. You don't require someone to have awareness to live outside the womb, you know, yeah, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I couldn't, I, I felt like these were kind of after the fact rationalizations um, rather than being a real prima facie argument for abortion uh, because they're not being applied consistently. Uh, but I, I don't want to sound like Spock here. Like, obviously, there is an emotional component to the abortion debate. Like, I'm, it's not all logic for anyone on either side. Um, and as I've become more active in the pro-life movement, I've really had the privilege of, you know, encountering so many amazing people with so many amazing stories, you know, courageous women who have kept their children in crazy circumstances. Um, I've met former abortion workers. I've even met abortion survivors. Uh, so having the honor of calling them friends and having an emotional connection with people who have, whose lives have been impacted by the pro-life movement is, is definitely something that motivates me. Now we go to Peggy Lunin with Life and Liberty for Women, and she'll be telling us about herself and her organization and how she got involved and everything like that. Peggy? Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, to, to debate Kelsey. My remarks are a little more prepared. I'm getting too old. <laughs> <laughs> um, I became involved in the pro-choice movement during the 1987 nomination and confirmation of Robert Bork for U.S. Supreme Court Justice. Uh, not only was the, he famous for his role in the Watergate scandal, but he was also a strict constructionist of the Constitution, and as such, he would have threatened Roe versus Wade. I subsequently worked in candidate campaigns and abortion rights campaigns in Washington State and in Colorado. Uh, in the mid-90s, I joined the board of Colorado NARAL. Uh, but after about four years, I became frustrated, feeling that the pro-choice movement needed more aggressive, uh, needed to be more aggressive in their approach, much more like the uh, movement in the 60s and 70s when Ms. Magazine published the 1973 picture of the now infamous picture of Jerry, a woman with two children found naked and dead on the floor of a motel room from a botched self-induced abortion performed when she was six months pregnant by her boyfriend who then left her to die. And that picture, by the way, is on our website under illegal ab abortion pictorial. Um, I reasoned that the abortion public policy must never again force desperate women to seek unsafe abortion services in the underground because our own history with illegal abortion was shameful. Most women who died uh, pre-row died from self-induced illegal abortion. The number of illegal abortions then is virtually the same as the legal abortions are now. Along with so-called back alley butchers, there were really good abortion providers who went underground, and many were left alone by law enforcement and DAs because they needed their services from time to time for their sisters, wives, daughters, and mistresses. Uh, I thought we were a great nation and we were better than that. Today, if abortion became illegal, desperate determined women and teens would turn to black market RU486, black market birth control, and illegal abortion providers. Again, some good doctors, others not so good, because it would open the floodgates for medically unqualified people to make a lot of money, as it was so many years ago. If you can learn how to build a bomb on the Internet, you can get advice on home remedies to abort. And how safe would that be? Good illegal abortion providers will once again trade their services. And so I looked at that and I said, does it sound like babies will get saved? In the world today where abortion is illegal, it hasn't stopped it, but it's made it dangerous and deadly for women. The Allen Guttmacher Institute said in 2012 that highly restrictive abortion laws are not associated with lower abortion rates. 
The abortion rate is 29 per 1,000 women of childbearing age in Africa, 32 per 100,000 or for 1,000 in Latin America. Um, in South Africa, the annual number of abortion-related deaths fell by 91% after the liberalization of the abortion law. <clears throat> the estimated annual number of deaths from unsafe abortion declined from 56,000 in 2003 to 47,000 in 2008. Um, in the United States, legal-induced abortion results in 0.6 deaths per 100,000 procedures. Worldwide, unsafe abortion accounts for death rates that is 350 times higher. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, the rate is 800 times higher at 460 per 100,000. What I guess I don't understand when I talk to anti-abortion people and groups is what makes them think that recriminalizing abortion in this country won't have the same results. It, and, and I say that because most of the time when I talk to them, they know very little of the actual facts of what happened when abortion was illegal. There are several great books out there, including The Abortionist, by Ricky Solinger, Doctors of Conscience by Carol Joffe, When Abortion Was a Crime by Leslie J. Rakin, and The Jane Service by Laura Kaplan, which talks about what abortion, illegal abortion was like back in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, not just in 1972, but back, uh, and in fact, The Jane Service uh, was a group of women who came together to do abortions in the four years prior to Roe v. Wade. Well, um, I reasoned that there was a better way to reduce the need and number of abortions in our country and that won't endanger the lives of desperate and determined women. I decided that abstinence-based comprehensive sex education, more birth control research, better birth control availability, like free through Obamacare, and men in condoms. So I left NARAL and formed Life and Liberty for Women. We don't believe that it's okay to mislead or deceive people in order to convert them to our position. While many throughout the world on both sides have done so, it's not our policy. Unfortunately, our experience with many in the anti-abortion movement has been what I describe as an institutional need to mislead and or deceive women. On our website, you'll find a page titled Truth About Anti-Abortion Pictures. Oh, it was about three or four years ago, maybe a little more than that. A few years ago, uh, one of our interns did some research and found that several of the mainstay pictures used by anti-abortion groups were deliberate misrepresentations of what they claimed to show. You know, embellishing for maximum effect has been a tactic of the anti-abortion movement for a long time. Uh, for example, Justice for All is an organization that has brought 18 feet high, I said 18 feet high, pictures of alleged aborted fetuses for maximum effect to college campuses around the country, including CSU here in Fort Collins. Uh, Life and Liberty for Women responded with our own pictures of what illegal abortion looked like, and you can see that on our website under educational boards. One note, our pictorial is not 18 feet high. Um, in addition, so-called crisis pregnancy centers across the country have been well known for their deceptive practices. In recent years, they've told women they'd like to do an ultrasound, you know, in order to just date their pregnancy, make sure all is well. When in reality, they intend to use the ultrasound to guilt women into becoming mothers. It's no secret in the crisis pregnancy center industry that they consider this a winning strategy. And while they promote parental notice or consent for abortion, they have no moral problem hooking teenagers up to ultrasounds without that. You can also read about that on our website under Anti-Abortion Crisis Pregnancy Centers. And these so-called crisis pregnancy centers that inv um, involve themselves in presenting deceptive and dangerous abstinence only until marriage sex education. On our website under sex education, you can read a 54-page report I did several years ago that led to the Alpha Center's ouster from the Colorado uh, Fort Collins School District here. We consult many sources and, uh, for our facts and statistics, medical websites, government websites like the National Institutes of Health, opinions of various qualified persons in the field, op-ed pieces from experts in the field, anti-abortion sites, and the Allen Guttmacher Institute, who does very extensive reproductive health research nationally and internationally. They are considered by many to be supportive of pro-choice issues, but their findings and statistics have been provided, have provided invaluable and unbiased reporting for decades, and it's a source cited even by anti-abortion people, including, I noticed, the secular pro-life. So that's kind that's of true. how um, I got involved and answers a couple of those questions that you have for us. Wonderful. Are you happy with that for your intro? I am. Okay. Um, let's go back to Kelsey and talk about abortion and the quality of life issues. How does your stance on abortion affect quality of life issues? When you're a pro-life person and you believe that a fetus is not fundamentally different than anyone else, 
that question sounds like, how does your stance on infanticide affect quality of life issues and scarcity of resources? And I guess the answer would be, well, badly. <laughs> but that's not, you know, if, if you think that the value of a human life is, is high, uh, regardless of age, uh, then the justification for, for abortion is no better than for infanticide. But uh, s- setting that aside, I do think that we should talk about quality of life issues because it's important obviously i mean set, setting abortion aside i think everyone pro life pro choice in good faith wants people to live lives of dignity um with at least basic minimum levels of food water shelter health care um those are the goals uh, the question is really is how we achieve them and i i have a quote because i really can't say this uh, any better than she does. Gabriela Olivares is Mexican American, or was she's passed, um, a Mexican American civil rights activist, and this is what she had to say on the subject. She said, "I'm not impressed or persuaded by those who express concern for the low-income woman who may find herself carrying an unplanned pregnancy, and for the future of the unplanned child who may be deprived of the benefits of a full life as a result of the parent's poverty." Because the fact remains that in this affluent nation of ours, pregnant cattle and horses receive better health care than pregnant poor women. The poor cry out for justice, and we respond with legalized abortion. And that sentiment comes out loud and clear, not just from her, but from a lot of low-income people who actually tend to be more pro-life than their wealthy counterparts. The the Gallup polling and and polling from other companies has been pretty consistent about that as well. So when the solution that you're proposing for poverty is opposed by the poor, you need to rethink where you're coming from. Um, Excuse me. The... There, that I, I'm not suggesting that there that poverty isn't a problem because it clearly is. But we what we have here is a problem with distribution of resources. Because let's be real, the babies being aborted are not the babies who would have had a huge carbon footprint, right? These are low income families who are doing their best to get by. They're the ones that are having abortions sold to them, and you don't see abor- abortion clinics set up near gated communities, you know, and I think it's really kind of sick, you know, for an abortion group to be going out into the ghetto or into uh, developing countries promoting this agenda, and then they go meet their donors in their wealthy mansions, right, and, and boast about how they're doing such great things for the population and the environment, right? It's It's messed up, and... And, and I should clarify that that attack is not directed uh, at Peggy's organization, which doesn't do abortions to begin with, um, but and, and doesn't particularly rely on the overpopulation argument either, from what I've seen in the website. Uh, but I, I do think that we need to bear those issues in mind um, when you have these th- this disparity of who is advocating abortion and who is receiving the abortion. Uh, there, there just has to be a better solution to the problem of poverty. There is a difference between working to eliminate poverty and working to eliminate poor people. All right? the, the former is noble, the latter is not. The, and and just as a general matter, getting, getting away from poverty and thinking about quality of, more, of, of life more generally, I think it's very arrogant for anyone to look at someone who hasn't even been born yet and determine that that life isn't going to be worth living. That, that's what abortion is. That's what abortion does. And you know, I, I would think that that's highly arrogant for anyone to make that determination about anyone else, um, even a mother, but certainly anyone else. Uh, and that, that kind of philosophy and way of looking at low-income people really bothers me. Um, I, I haven't used up my full 15 minutes, but that's all, about all I have to say. Okay, well, thank you. Peggy, are you ready to answer the same question? How does your stance on abortion affect quality of life issues? Sure, I am. Thank you. I appreciate the 
opportunity again. Um, to most people today, the quality of life issues involve a life in which they've got a good job, enough money to meet their needs, their family's needs, having a path to happiness and contentment, and a life where they have good relationships with a significant other, family, friends, and means having a good education. Um, I also think that when you're talking about the quality of life issues, you have to talk about or see, fully see, what women see through their own lives as they are in their own shoes going through their life. Um, a decision regarding an unintended pregnancy is a very personal one. Abortion is a, a, a personal decision. Women faced with an unintended pregnancy aren't thinking about the impact on the U.S. Social Security Fund that their continued pregnancy would have, and that's an argument that's made sometimes by extreme anti-abortion people. She isn't thinking about the impact her decision is to terminate or not terminate will have on the world at large that she lives in. She's thinking about the impact on her own life and the life she would be bringing into the world. Um, and if, 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 if nobody else has a right to think about that and make a decision about that, she certainly does. She's thinking, um, the Ellen Goodmark Institute said in July 2014, the reasons women give for having an abortion underscore their understanding of the responsibilities of parenthood and family life. Three quarters of women cite concern for or responsibility to other individuals. Um, three fourths of them say they can't afford a child. Three fourths say having a baby would interfere with work, school, or the ability to care for dependents. Um, half of them say they don't want to be a single parent or having problems with their husband or partner. Those were the quality of life goals of the women of our past as well. Before legal abortion and before the pill, women's quality of life was really dire. Controlling their fertility was a daily struggle with most particularly and not surprisingly for poor women and women of color. They struggled the most then and now. Leslie J. Reagan wrote in When Abortion Was a Crime that family finances played an enormous role in women's decisions to abort. In 1918, a 22-year-old mother of three despaired when she suspected another pregnancy. Her husband had tuberculosis and could barely work. They had taken in five of his orphaned brothers and sisters, and she now cared for a family of ten. She did all the cooking, housework, sewing, and cared for the baby. The thought of one more made her crazy, and she took drugs to bring on her monthly sickness. Some women, Leslie says, sought abortions because they were afraid of being beaten by husbands who reacted with rage when they learned that another child was on the way. Of others, Leslie says, the need for abortion grew out of their concern for the well-being of their existing children. Most of the women who had abortions in the early 20th century were married and already mothers. Mothers often explained their abortions in terms of the family's scarce resources. Another sibling would take food away from the children they already had and loved. For poor families, more children might mean that an older daughter or son would have to go to work for the family. Leslie says, one woman writing to Margaret Sanger for help with birth control told Sanger, my husband has been out of work for six months and no help is in sight. I can't afford more children. She told Sanger that every year, every year, she performed two abortions on herself. Leslie notes, the disaster of the Great Depression touched all aspects of women's lives, including the most intimate ones, and brought about a new high in the incidence of abortion. As jobs evaporated and wages fell, families found themselves living on insecure and scanty funds. Many working people lost their homes, tenants had their belongings put out on the street, and married couples gave up their children to orphanages because they couldn't support them. I think the one thing as we look down the pike from the 2007, 2008, 2009, maybe even 2010 time period, I think statistics will come out and show that there was a lack in terms of birth in those years. Because when the economy goes bad, people go, well, I can't afford a child, I'm not going to have a child and those who do find themselves pregnant in those circumstances may tend to abort if they, can't, if they believe they can't afford it. Now, what's very different from those stories and women of today? Not much. The New York Magazine, November 10, 2013, in an article titled My Abortion, there's three women I'd like to, I'd like to introduce you to two. One is Cherise. She's an African-American woman. She lives in Illinois. Uh, this was about 2002, 2004. I looked in the Chicago Yellow Pages and made an appointment, she says, at what I thought was an abortion clinic. They sent a black woman in to talk to me. She told me that she and her husband hadn't wanted their first child either and tried to convince me to keep mine. Then they showed me a video of a D&E extraction. They assumed I was on food stamps, and at that time I didn't even know how to articulate why that was so offensive. I was a 28-year-old paralegal, not the stereotype. Well, they sent me home with a rattle and a onesie. This was in 2002, not some bygone era. 
They sent me to another place to get a free ultrasound. The technician said, if you have an abortion now, you'll rupture your uterus and you won't be able to have children in the future. She says, I had no idea what was true. I didn't know, I didn't want to regret not being able to have children. So she said, I went ahead and had my son. But she says, those people weren't there after I lost my job and I couldn't afford my COBRA, my utilities, my rent, and my food. Since then, I've had three abortions. I didn't understand my body, I had no information, and after the third time I ran into a reproductive justice advocate who finally taught me how to understand my fertility. Then there's Lauren. She's 34 from Colorado in 2003. Although I always thought it was a woman's right to choose, I honestly thought if I got pregnant I'd find a way to make it work. But all that changed. My boyfriend terrorized me. At some point I decided it was safer to have him in my life and cut him out. But when I got pregnant, I knew right away I didn't want a lifelong connection to that person, and I was right. When we later broke up, he sawed my clothes in half and poured corn syrup in my gas tank. During the ultrasound, I shouted, we're not keeping it. It was a way of not acknowledging the life form. But when I went to the clinic, there were protesters with lawful graphic signs. I felt their judgment. But other experiences have changed me even more. This year, in 2003, she writes, I had another DNC after a mi I miscarried. And it's amazing how much I mourned that pregnancy. The same experience can be so different when you are in a different place in your life. Finally, let me introduce you to Red. She's 30 from Pennsylvania. This was 2008. She says, when I got pregnant with my son, my very controlling boyfriend had convinced me that birth control poisoned my body. We usually slept in the car. I took a pregnancy test peeing over the kind of bucket you mix concrete in outside a dilapidated vacant house. She said, I decided I couldn't abort a baby based on a stupid decision I made. They tell you you love the baby automatically, but it's not true. Then in 2008, I was pregnant by my boyfriend, Steve. We worked at Target together. He wanted to get married and have the baby, and I was barely supporting the son I had, still living with my parents. I didn't want to be tied to Steve forever. My mom and I went to Planned Parenthood. It was pouring rain. The picketers met us at the car with disgusting pictures. I was quite emotional, but I, wasn't, uh, but I was so scared that if I showed any emotions, they wouldn't let me do it. I told them I already had had a baby. The doctor acted like it was assembly line work. I told Steve I miscarried. We dated another year. The secret was devastating. People might be more understanding if I had an abortion when I was living in a car or an abusive relationship. This time I was on birth control with a full-time job of boyfriend. People might think I should have kept it, but I couldn't. Um, today, if women, if they can afford it or through Obamacare, have access to a wide range of birth control options. However, the anti-abortion movement is in no mood to allow that to stand. Obamacare's repeal, free birth control for hundreds of thousands of women goes away. What's their quality of life now? But even more sinister is what the personhood amendment would do to the access to female hormonal birth control in this country. Personhood amendments define a person as any human being from the moment of fertilization. Not only would such an amendment ban all abortions in the state, but in the country as well should one pass in Congress, it would ban the pill, the morning after pill like Plan B and Ella. It would ban IUDs, Deprovera, Norplant, and the patch. These birth controls prevent either fertilization or implantation of a fertilized egg. The anti-abortion movement ignores the fact that a pregnancy doesn't begin and isn't recognized by medical science until implantation because it isn't until then that a woman's body tells her she's pregnant. So a personhood amendment passes with abortion illegal and without female hormonal birth control. We see the shadow of our history engulfing women and families in the deep despair of the past. Is this the quality of life secular pro-life has in mind for women? Regardless of what I or Kelsey or any of you out there may think of varied reasons women have an abortion, their reasons and desperation would be absolutely no different if abortion were illegal. And our own history with illegal abortion documents that. And I would urge everybody to go out and read a whole lot more about what women's lives were like and what the quality of their lives were like when abortion was illegal. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Would you like to um, rebut? <laughs> Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, I, I think, you know, for, first of all, I do want to emphasize that we have some common ground here, which is that Secular Pro Life strongly supports sex education and birth control. Uh, so we, we really do not need to debate that point. Uh, the 
What, what really struck me, though, about the stories you were telling, which are absolutely heartbreaking, it is that abortion is a symptom of much deeper problems. Uh, abortion does not make anyone unpoor. It does not improve relationships with disgusting scumbag men. It, does not, it, it is a Band-Aid that, that, that makes women undergo surgery uh, rather than giving women the help that they actually need for the underlying issues. Uh, and you know, I, I've, I've seen in my own years as a pro-life advocate how those stories can turn out differently and how they can turn out better if we as a community step up and help, offer real help. Uh, you know, I, I have a good friend, Heather, who um, was married to someone who had some, some criminal issues, uh, and he um, was from out of the country and was on the verge of being deported due to his criminal activity, uh, and she really didn't want to be married to him. She was considering divorce, uh, which ultimately is what she did and, and was the right decision, um, and she, around that time, got pregnant. And she freaked, and she decided that she was going to have an abortion, and she went to the clinic, and there were people on the sidewalk, but they didn't have bloody signs, and they weren't yelling at her. It was an older lady who said, let's get an ultrasound for you. If it's really just a clump of cells, that's all you'll see, and what will be the harm? And Heather thought, you know, that's, she, she's right. I should see what's going on in my body. I, I should know. Uh, and when she saw that ultrasound, she saw past all the propaganda. She saw that this was not a clump of cells. This was not a tissue growth or all the other euphemisms that we use when the pregnancy is unwanted but discard when it's planned. She saw her son Judah, and she had her son. And the pregnancy center was there for her. They helped her out a lot. She's gone through job training. Um, she did, as I said, divorce her husband, which greatly improved her life. Um, and some years later, she became pregnant again. She used the services of a maternity home. I was there the day after the baby was born. Um, she was going through a rough time in her life, her relationship with her own parents and her family, but things have gotten better for her now. And she is a single mom of two, and there is no shame in that. Uh, I think part of the issue when we're looking at stories of you know, pre-Roe v. Wade and the, the I, I should say that uh, the argument that Peggy is making is the one I respect the most. You know, obviously we don't agree, but I can respect that more because it isn't relying on pretending that the baby isn't a baby. It isn't relying upon, you know, clumps of cells and that sort of thing. Um, it's... It's talking about a positive value of women's equality, right? That is a value. I am a feminist. Uh, the issue that I see is that you can assert that abortion is necessary for women's equality, but we've never actually tried having women's equality without abortion. We've, it has not happened in the United States. It's not as though things progressed in a linear fashion. It's not like we passed Title IX and got the elite colleges co-ed and uh, you know, allowed women to sue for sexual harassment in the workplace and did all of these things, and then after all that didn't work, we finally allowed abortion. That's not, it was all jumbled up together in time. Like The pre-abortion days, yeah, they were oppressive, but not because you couldn't abort. For a plethora of reasons that time was oppressive. So you really have to look outside the United States for any kind of example of how it might work to have a pro-life ethos that respects both the woman and the child. Um, and one great example actually is Chile. Uh, they uh, respect the right to life, uh, don't allow abortion unless 
the mother's life is in danger, but they have readily available contraception. They've invested in girls' education. They've done all these other things as far as the social services are concerned, and they have one of the lowest, if not the lowest, maternal mortality rates on the continent. So it is doable. It's a matter of getting people to invest the time and the effort and the resources, and a lot of people aren't willing to do that, especially when, you know, it's cheaper to just put in a bunch of money for abortion. Um, That's five minutes. That's a root of the problem. Sorry. All right, well, I was done. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, Peggy, would you like to share your rebuttal? Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, the... Uh, you know, Life and Liberty for Women um, is concerned about public policy of abortion. Um, we've, you know, the need for women's equality is that long path to, that we need to have abortion for that. Maybe in the 60s and 70s that was a, a, a valid argument, but now that's not where the argument is. It certainly isn't for Life and Liberty for Women. Um, but women, you know, I, I, I took a little exception to what Kelsey said. Women know exactly what they're doing when they abort. They, they know exactly that there is potential life in them, um, and they know exactly what they're doing. They're extinguishing that life. They know that. Uh, what I just read a minute ago about Lauren when she said that um, that she, during the ultrasound, she shouted, we're, keep, we're not keeping it because it was a way of, acknowledge, not, of, not, a way of not acknowledging the life form. Women are, know exactly what they're doing when they have an abortion, um, but they know why they're having an abortion, um, and it's for their quality of life issues. Uh, the other thing I'd like to touch on is that you, Kelsey said that she supported birth control, that, that their organization supported birth control, but on her website she talks about uh, fetal personhood. And if you believe in personhood, and, and there's a couple of different ways anti-abortion people throw, it, throw that word around, but if you believe in personhood, you believe that uh, person is from conception to birth. From the time of fertilization to birth, you have a person, and therefore it should be protected in law from conception. And if, you, if secular pro-life believes that, then do they also believe that the personhood amendments that are floating around out there, three of which came to Colorado voters and were voted down three times by a three-to-one margin, and that meant that anti-abortion people also voted against them because they would not only ban abortions, but they would ban birth control. So you cannot be a supporter of fetal personhood from conception to birth and not realize that the personhood amendment out there doesn't support the birth control. Um, and finally, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about, uh, for a second, about, again, illegal abortion. The problem is, is that when anti-abortion people talk about it, they like to talk about it right near Roe. And yes, we had antibiotics come into being there, and that is if women went to hospitals. Most women who died pre-Roe died from, pre, uh, from self-induced abortions. And a lot of them didn't go to hospitals. Um, and they wanted to protect their identity and their abortionists if they, if they had, had gone to an abortion. So while the invention of the antibiotics, you know, early in the 60s, 70s, 60s, 70s, that came into being, even a little before that, the problem is, is that illegal abortion killed a whole lot of women. And we don't know exactly how many women, because what happens when abortion goes underground, it's called a secrecy. It's secret. And many people, especially if they were rich, were able to buy death certificates that didn't list the cause of death, as a, of death from abortion. So we don't have the greatest handle on exactly how many except through anecdotal information. And when you go to the books that I talked about, especially Re Leslie J. Reagan's book, When Abortion Was a Crime, or Doctors of Conscience, and you read about the anecdotal stories in these books, you get a good feel how many, how many women come in each night to the hospital having self-induced and, and bleeding. So, and then the question becomes, what happens if we make abortion illegal today? Is, is that going to happen again? Well... Of course, because it goes into the underground and it becomes secret again. 
And so when, when Kelsey talked about the deaths before Roe and Al, there was only like 24 in 1972. Well, that's a little deceptive because she hasn't looked at what happened when abortion was illegal throughout the totality of that time. And I hope you folks out there will do that. I hope you will look at those books that I talked about and look at the totality out there and then compare it with what might happen today. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Now back to you, Kelsey. Um, how do you define right to life, and what is your position on personhood and bodily autonomy? Also, would you take a position that abortion should be eliminated as an elective procedure um, at 23 weeks of gestation and only be permitted after 23 weeks in the event that the mother's life is jeopardized by a high percentage of risk of serious injury or death? to both mother and fetus. All right, we've got a we've got a multi part question. I'll start with the yeah. second part which is um uh, and, and the 23 mark, uh, 23 week mark, I believe you picked because of research on the, on fetal pain. Right. Um the the research on fetal pain is uh, not yet set totally in stone. Um, pro life movement has been relying on studies that put it at 20 weeks, you know, a little earlier than 20. Well, it depends on whether you're counting LMP or gestation. But pro-life movement generally puts it a few weeks earlier, and then I've seen the abortion movement put it even into 32, 34 weeks, which would mean that preemies uh, aren't capable of pain. So you, you've just got a wide spectrum, and a big part of that is the fact that pain is subjective. Uh, a baby can't tell you if something hurts. So you're trying to rely on a lot of clues, and you know if, uh, if a baby in the womb is poked with a metal object and flinches, is that pain? Is that just a glitch or a, a fluke? Um, is it maybe not pain, but just reacting to something being weird in the environment? We can't really know that. Um, science isn't at that point yet. Um, but set, setting aside the, the difficulties in pinpointing uh, when pain begins, um, certainly after the fetus is capable of feeling pain, whenever that might be, um, that ought to be a common ground point after which we say no abortions. Uh, we have animal welfare laws in this country, most civilized countries do, uh, where we try to minimize pain for animals and prohibit the torture of animals. And even if you don't believe that a human fetus is a person who has earned their rights, uh, they're at a minimum animals. Uh, so that should be a point of gr common ground. Obviously it isn't, but it should be. Um, prior to that, uh, I think the, the issue of fetal pain, it, it is important because we want to be humane, obviously. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a painless death is okay. Uh, you know, if someone kills me in my sleep and I never feel a thing and I don't know that I've gone, I guess that's better than the alternative of being shot while I'm awake, but it's still wrong. Uh, so the, and, and another, uh, another thing I like to talk about in connection with fetal pain uh, is that there's a very rare genetic condition uh, called congenital insensitivity to pain, um, which is exactly what it sounds like, people, uh, grown adults uh, who can't feel pain, um, which sounds awesome until you start thinking about it for a while. It's actually horrible because little kids will bite off their tongue, like the tip of their tongue, bite it off and not feel it, um, will walk through fire ant hills and not feel it. So you can have serious injuries. Um, but I'm getting a little off track with that. The point being, I don't think anyone in their right mind is going to discard them and say that they aren't persons um, worthy of the right to life. So, that, so pain is important, but it can't be the qualifier for human rights. It can't be the qualifier for the right to life. Um, pain, you know, so it's, it's an aspect of the abortion debate, but it doesn't really go to the heart of it, at least not to me. Um, so, um, so going back earlier to what you were saying about um, the right to life and bodily autonomy, I do believe that all human beings are equal. Uh, regardless of age and regardless of gender. I believe that the fetus and the mother don't have to be opposed to each other, but should be treated in, with equal dignity and equal rights, uh, which means that both have the right to life and both have the right to bodily autonomy. Uh, pregnancy, obviously, is a very unique part of the life cycle. Um, there is, it, it's very difficult to come up with good analogies for pregnancy. 
you know, people try it in the abortion debate all the time. They talk about, you know, kidney donations and, and things like that. Nothing quite hits the mark, but I think the thing that comes closest is conjoined twins. Because conjoined twins are both people. They're both human. Um, they have bodily autonomy that has been limited, um, not through any fault of their own, right? because you know, the, the assumption is always that the pro-life movement is sex negative and that we're trying to punish people for having sex. And that is not what I believe. Uh, it, pregnancy, like con- conjoined twindom, it just happens sometimes in nature. Uh, it's a part of life. It's a fact of life. Uh, It's not anybody's fault. It's not something that anybody needs to be punished for. So how do we approach uh, conjoined twins? Well, if both, if they can be separated and both survive, that's what we do out of respect for bodily autonomy, if both can survive. That's birth. Um, If one can survive... Um, but the other is dying, is threatening the life of the twin uh, due to you know, some, some significant infection or something, and that one's going to die. The healthy twin can be saved with separation. We separate. That's like abortion to save the mother's life. Um, what we don't do is give one twin the unilateral power to kill the other. That is what we do not do. We do not say... I don't, you know, this twin wants to be separated, uh, the other one doesn't. The other one uh, isn't healthy enough to make it on their own. But the dominant twin, the healthier twin, wants to be separated, so screw the weaker twin, we're doing it, because bodily autonomy reigns supreme. No doctor is going to do that. That's crazy. Uh, that, will, that will cause you to immediately lose your medical license. So if we're trying, what we're trying to do here is not to create some special category for women, treat women any differently because they're pregnant. What we want to do is create a uniform standard, regardless of sex or age, that all people have the right to life. And the right to life is a foundational, basic human right. I'm very troubled by attempts to limit it um, by suggesting that you have to earn the right to life through acquiring some ability, uh, whether that ability is the ability to feel pain or consciousness, self-awareness, and so on. These are human rights. They're not self-aware rights or born rights. They're human rights. So that's the perspective that secular pro-life takes. It's based, it, it really is a human rights framework uh, and a scientific framework as far as when the beginning of life uh, occurs. Is that your complete? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Kelsey. Um, now we'll go to Peggy with Life of Liberty for Women regarding the same questions. Okay, and there were multiple questions in there, and so um, <laughs> let me start this way. Um, we at Life and Liberty for Women are pragmatic. We are very different than the mainstream uh, pro-choice groups, and that's why I broke away from them. And in, in some respect, I guess I'm considered a bit of a black sheep of the pro-choice movement because I do handle things differently, and I do think a little differently about it, and I am a little more aggressive in our approach. I know the feeling. (laughs) (laughs) I bet you do. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Primarily with what the public policy regarding abortion should be and why. We leave the question of when life begins and whether abortion is a moral option to an unintended pregnancy to individual women to make based on their own set of religious and moral values. We don't talk women into abortions or out of abortions. They call us, they say we want information on adoption, we give them that. We want information on parenting, we give them that. We want information on abortion, and we give them that, no questions asked. Um, We believe that Roe versus Wade correctly and morally balanced the right to life of woman and fetus. Roe allows states to step in at the third trimester after viability to make abortion illegal except for the health and life of the woman. Pregnancy presents a very unique, as Kelsey said, relationship between two human beings, one dependent for life on the other for three quarters of this unique relationship. In Abortion Rights and Fetal Personhood by Ed Dorr and James Prescott, 1989, they say even if we could reach a moral consensus in our society to consider the fetus a person, it would not mean that the law should outlaw abortion. 
a fetus person in quotes is unlike any other being that we designate as person because only the fetus uses the body of another human being for its physical life support system and I would say with the exception of perhaps conjoined trends. The difference being is that the fetus is unborn versus already born human beings in the conjoined twins. And that makes a big difference in what you're talking about um, in, in terms of approach um, and legality. Um, personhood amendments on the ballots across this country is the culmination of decades of anti-abortion efforts to give the unborn a legal right to life from conception to birth, equal to that of the already born woman. And that's what I think Kelsey was saying. Um, but the implications of that in legal practice presents a conundrum that anti-abortion people have not yet seen fit to address. What happens in law, in public policy, if the unborn is given an equal right to life with the woman from conception to birth, making abortion illegal with no exceptions? I want you to think about that. In all of the proposed personhood amendments, there are absolutely no exceptions written into these laws. Anti-abortion people have said to me, well, of course there's a woman's life would be protected. I say, where in that law is it protected? If it isn't in the law itself, as an exception, as in Roe and Doe decisions, it is not protected. Imagine courtrooms with attorneys for the unborn arguing under this law that their client, having an equal right to life with a woman from conception through birth, cannot be forced to give up their right to life for that of the woman, even as she faces a dire threat to her health or life. Now, what does the attorney's woman, or the attorney's, uh, what does the woman's attorney argue? Well, without the balance in the right to life provided by Roe and the exceptions in the third trimester provided by Roe and Doe, a woman has absolutely no recourse. Well, what could a judge do? The law is crystal clear. They are equal in their right to life, conception to birth. He could not rule in favor of either one of them. The law is articulated within the four corners of the pages like a written contract. And just like a written contract, a legal document, it cannot be altered or changed orally as in a judicial decision. Changes, exceptions, would have to be written into the contract, into the law, before a judge could, within then those guidelines, make any kind of decision for the fetus, for the woman, for the fetus, for the woman. Interestingly, anti-abortion groups hate not just the health exceptions in Doe, but most think, too, that abortions to protect the health and life of the woman from a fetus with fetal, fatal fetal anomaly, primarily determined in late pregnancy, or the termination of a pregnancy because of a life-threatening illness of the woman herself is mostly made up in, to enable a woman to have an abortion because she, well, I don't know, somehow suddenly woke up one morning in late pregnancy and decided she doesn't want to be pregnant anymore. Um, they ignore the stories and most telling the statistics on late-term abortions. In 2010, just over 19,000 abortions were performed at 21 weeks or later out of 1.6 million. And 21 weeks isn't even near the outset at all of viability. So with those irrational thoughts in mind, could we ever expect the anti-abortion movement to add a health or life exception to those personhood amendments? Now, the balancing of the right to life between woman and fetus is necessary for the legality of abortion. It makes legal and moral sense. Life and Liberty for Women believes that bodily autonomy isn't absolute from conception to birth. It must be bridled by the guidelines in Roe and Doe, something that women in America, since the Roe versus Wade decision and the Doe decision were decided, have certainly settled into as a given. So prior to viability, bodily autonomy is a legitimate argument by women. The undeniable scientific existence of a point of viability is what makes the pregnancy relationship different and unique. Now while viability is, is there's not one specific week, we do know it falls within a group of weeks. And it has always done that. So it's not a totally movable kind of, of, of death. If we make abortion illegal, there will be no protection for viable fetuses. I want to say that again. If we make abortion illegal, personhood amendment passes, abortions across the country are illegal. 
there will be no protection for viable fetuses because abortion will move to the underground. An unintended consequence that anti-abortion movement doesn't address or just has their head in the sand about. Leslie J. Reagan said of the women pre-Roe, the historical record clearly shows that generations of women desired and needed abortions, and neither law nor church nor taboo could stop them. In their conversations and behavior, women expressed their sense that abortion was morally acceptable, and through their actions they asserted a right to make a moral decision about reproduction and to use abortion. They didn't use the language of civil rights, she said, to express their views, but simply assumed that the decision to avoid childbearing through the use of contraceptives and abortion was theirs to make. Now, after Roe and Doe, as I said, women accepted it as a given that bodily autonomy will not be applied after viability, except to protect their health and life. Now, life and liberty for women would not support restricting abortion prior to viability or at 23 weeks or earlier. Viability is recognized uh, in the medical community to begin between, oh, say, 24 weeks at the outset and 28 weeks. Quint Boniker Preemie Survival Foundation says babies born at 23 weeks have only a 17% chance of survival. At 24 weeks, the chance of survival goes to only 39%, and it goes up to only 50% at 25 weeks. Now, viability works on a bell curve. Uh, an occasional baby may be born at 21, 22 weeks may survive, though not without lifelong mental and or physical complications, while many born at 26 weeks will die. Many factors, including prenatal care, health of the woman, distance from medical care, can also affect any particular outcome of a premature birth. Now, Clint Bonker Preemie Survival Foundation says one in ten premature babies will develop a permanent disability, such as lung disease, cerebral palsy, blindness, or deafness. They say 50% of premature babies born the 26th week, before the 26th week, are disabled, a quarter severely so. Um, the U.S. National Library of Medicine of the National Institutes of Health at April, um, um, April 25, 2006, a resource that Angela cited for Kelsey and I and that we both addressed, uh, regarding whether fetuses can feel pain, Stuart Dubershire, the senior lecturer at University of Birmingham who um, apparently wrote that, said that the neural anatomical system for pain can be considered complete by 26 weeks, but while a developed neural anatomical system is necessary, it isn't sufficient for pain experience. He says pain experience requires development of the brain, but also requires development of the mind to accommodate the subjectivity of pain. He says development of the mind occurs outside the womb through the actions of the infant and mutual adjustment with primary caregivers. He concludes that proposals to inform women seeking abortions of the potential for pain in fetuses are not supported by the evidence. And as Kelsey said, that has basically said that evidence out there is still not there, and that's what he says. He says legal or clinical mandates for interventions to prevent such pain are scientifically unsound and may expose women to inappropriate interventions, risks, and distress. He says avoiding a discussion of fetal pain with women requesting abortions is not misguided paternalism, but a sound policy based on good evidence that fetuses can experience pain. And I would imagine, considering Kelsey's uh, remarks, she believes that as well. So until medical science can conclusively say that a fetus feels pain and when, there's no reason to make public policy where none is proven to be needed. Thank you, Angela. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Do I have time for rebuttal? Um, yes, we're going to give each of you 10 minutes for a rebuttal. So, Kelsey, you'll give your rebuttal, and then Peggy will have an opportunity to, one more time, to speak after your rebuttal. Fantastic. Um, I, I do want to um, uh, address a few things that she said. Um, I'll start with the last, which was uh, you know, my, my view of fetal pain. I think that the research um, is is difficult to pin down, uh, but the, but I don't think that we have to wait for a conclusive answer before we consider the possibility of fetal pain, because that is a horrifying possibility, uh, and I do believe that women should be informed that that is a possibility, that there are studies showing that that may be a possibility, uh, and that uh, if there's really any chance that a fetus could be could experience the pain of being torn limb from limb that we have a moral responsibility to stop it um so that that was just my my quick rebuttal on that um 
I uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, her legal commentary about the personhood amendment. I actually am a lawyer. Um, I am an attorney by day, and I run Secular Pro-Life by night and on weekends. <laughs> I have a very busy life. Um, and Peggy neglected to discuss a very common uh, legal doctrine, uh, which does, in fact, allow you to kill a legally recognized person. Uh, and that is the doctrine of self-defense, uh, which is not going to magically disappear uh, when the person involved is defeated. Uh, that is not something that is written down into statute. It's something that has developed in the common law, um, going way back to England and, and even before looking at ancient legal texts. Uh, and that is very deeply ingrained into our criminal justice system, this doctrine of self-defense. Um, so even if it is not written into the criminal code or written into a personhood amendment, the mere fact that someone is identified legally as a person does not prevent them from being killed in all cases. Uh, Self-defense is an exception that is recognized in the law. And as I said before, we're not looking for babies to have greater rights, just equal rights. So the self-defense doctrine would continue uh, to to apply to uh, permit abortions in cases where the woman's life is in danger. I have difficulty understanding the uh, significance that life and liberty for women assigns to viability. Um, Not not just because I think it's um, hard to pin down and subjective, but mainly because um, the fact that a baby could survive outside the womb, um, while interesting, uh, doesn't have much practical significance if you're not suggesting that they should. Um, I don't think anyone on the pro-choice side is saying that um, in lieu of late-term abortions, we should induce premature births. I don't think anyone is saying that. I certainly don't think you're saying that because you clearly recognize uh, how dangerous premature birth can be uh, from your comments. I don't think you're advocating that. Um, But if you're not advocating that, I don't see what the significance of viability is. It's just another marker, um, but it doesn't actually signify independence from the pregnant woman. Uh, they're still conjoined. Uh, you're, you're saying that separation surgery is possible, but you're not doing it um, for, for very good reasons. Uh, so I've, I've, I've never understood what the philosophical or moral significance of viability is, given that we act, aren't actually causing the baby to be born early uh, to vindicate bodily autonomy, because that's insane. Uh, so so I, I, I would love for Peggy, if you could just elaborate on why it is that, that viability is so great. Um, and finally, I did want to just mention, not... Um, not specifically in response to this, but just in response to uh, to Peggy's comments generally, back alley abortion is still with us. Abortion is legal, and it's still underground. Uh, the lack of oversight is incredible. Kermit Gosnell is an obvious example, but he's, in a, he's the key example for very good reasons, because he was living in a state where abortion was legal, where you had a pro-choice state government administration where inspections, random inspections weren't happening, and he was going on for years killing newborn babies, maiming women, one of, one of whom was an immigrant who died, uh, and he was going, he was just skirting along for years, and he didn't even get caught until a comp- for, he, was ca- he was caught for totally unrelated reasons. He got greedy and started doing a little uh, uh, painkiller uh, drug trade on the side. That's how the power of the law got to Kermit Gosnell. So we have no idea how many other Gosnells are out there. Uh, it's insane. And abortion access hasn't stopped these people from preying on women because it's not as though there weren't other abortionists in Philadelphia. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a little worked up about this, but when you see ambulances outside the abortion centers, uh, you know, multiple times a month, and you see all the, you know, when you see people like Jennifer Morrison and Lakeisha Wilson and, you know, people who don't get any of the press, whose pictures aren't in Ms. Magazine because they're politically inconvenient, yeah, it pisses me off. So, 
<laughs> and I, I, I mean no disrespect to Peggy, because Peggy, I know you're just as passionate as I am, uh, but we, we don't see eye to eye on this one. Making abortion legal didn't make it safe. Peggy, or was that it for Kelsey? Kelsey? Yes. Okay. Peggy, what are your thoughts uh, for your closing and final rebuttal? Um, well, a couple of things. I, I want to touch on the fact that uh, uh, Kelsey talked about a doctrine of self-defense. And while I realize that a doctrine of self-defense is out there, I did not, not know that. But it seems to me that in the personhood amendment and as passionate as anti-abortion people who support these and push these want the right to life to be equal to that of the woman, I would be hard-pressed to see how the doctrine of self-defense would, if it at all, be applied in, in the situation of a personhood amendment. I'm not so sure at all that our legal system would be able to apply that. I mean, she throws that out there and says, well, you know, it just doesn't disappear, but the fact is is that under a personhood amendment, we don't know that you can apply a doctrine of self-defense. Because the way it's written, they're given such equal right to life that I don't even believe a doctrine of self-defense under current statutes could do that. Um, I, I think that's a convenient thing to throw out, but I don't think there's any proven uh, uh, thing. It, it, there's no way to prove that that would, would solve the issue that I brought up. Um, talking about Gosnell and a few abortion providers perhaps in the country like him, we always have bad apples. We've talked about, you know, I talked about the, you know, some of the anti-abortion bad apples, if you will. We have them all over the country in all kinds of work, in the legal field, you know, and everywhere. But for her, for Kelsey to suggest that what was going on with Gosnell, and there was another one in that article, um, constitutes back alley abortions again compared to what we saw and what went on and what the uh, environment was when abortion was illegal um, doesn't wash here. And I really think, Kelsey, you need to take a look at exactly what back alley abortions were and exactly what they meant. We have things in place today and maybe they weren't used properly and I can consent to perhaps they weren't used properly to, to find out about this person before it got to the point it did. But the back alley issue of illegal abortion is so vast throughout the country. You wouldn't just have a one of Gosnell, you'd have a hundreds of thousands of them across the country. I don't think you want to go from one or two or five or ten in the country, if we should ever discover that, to hundreds of thousands of them in the country. And that's what you had from midwives, from people who weren't real doctors, to real doctors. You had a whole hundreds of thousands of people doing um, illegal abortions, not to mention women doing illegal abortions on themselves. So I don't think that comparing that to the back alley of yesteryear is a, is a proper uh, connection to make. And, and I'm a little taken back by that because I don't think you know what back alley abortions looked like before. Um, and to suggest that we, that legal abortion isn't safer than it was when it was illegal maybe speaks to how young you are and what you don't know of illegal abortion because that's simply not true. And, and the, you know, the Alan Guttmacher Institute talks about the safety of abortion. If you look at, quote, uh, if you look at the international field and uh, what I talked about in, from Alan Guttmacher Institute, you'll find that how unsafe they are in those countries where it's illegal. So I, I really do think before you start comparing back alley with Gosnell to back alley abortions, that, that you need to take a look at that. Um, and again, I don't think that the self-defense doctrine will be applied to the, to the personhood amendment. Um, I can't imagine anti-abortion people allowing that to happen at all. And if they were to do that, you know what? It seems to me that they would be in her life, in her medical history. She, they would be all over her. We've got to make sure that this is a real self-defense issue. So I, I really don't buy the doctrine of self-defense as, um, as something that's going to allow a woman 
to override the equal right to life that personhood amendment would give a fetus. Um, and then let me talk just briefly for a second about viability. The, the thing about viability is a point at which the autonomy, bodily autonomy can be severed and can be said to say that, okay, at this point, except for a woman's health and life, the pregnancy cannot be terminated. It can't be terminated for any reason. And I think that's a good point at which to say this is where we balance the right to life. And, uh, you know, we are, we, you know, we're pragmatists and we have to live in a society in which abortion will exist. Whether Kelsey likes it or not, whether any other anti-abortion, whether any of you out there like it or not, abortion is going to exist. And the question becomes, how do we want it to exist in our society? Do we want it to exist like it did in the olden days? Do we really want to go there? With black market RU486 now in the picture and, and, and the Internet in the picture, where our teens can get a hold of this, do we really want to go back to that? Or would we rather say, let's do something Let's leave it safe and legal for women who are going to choose it, no matter what the law. And let's work together on reducing the need with uh, uh, sex education and birth control um, and educating people about birth control. So I, I really think that uh, when it comes down to it, the question is how do we want abortion to exist in our society because it doggone will exist in our society whether any of us like it or not. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Well, thank you both for joining me. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Thank you so much.